In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing me and Jennifer together to share our conversation and our rosary with the Peace with Dementia Rosary community. We pray that this, uh, that this conversation is a blessing to them, that they take lessons from them and inspiration, that they not only enjoy themselves, but can share it with others. In your name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Peace with Dementia Rosary podcast. My name is Matt Estrad, and I help busy Catholic families who are impacted by Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. I am so excited to bring you today's guest, Jennifer Fabrizi, who is joining us from New Brunswick, Canada. Let me tell you a little bit about Jennifer. She is a, uh, she is a chaplain at a long-term care facility in New Brunswick, Canada. She is completing a Master's of Arts degree in pastoral counseling at Holy Apostles College and Seminary and is working towards a certification with the Canadian Association for Spiritual Care. Prior to becoming a chaplain, Jennifer worked in various capabilities and capacities with people who have a, de de have a developmental disability or a cognitive impairment. She applies this experience to her current role where she spends a large amount of time caring for residents living with dementia. Jennifer is a revert to Catholicism. She and her husband, Richard, are parents of four children, ages 10 through 16. Jennifer, welcome to the Peace with Dementia Rosary podcast. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. I'm so, so excited to be part of this awesome ministry of yours. So thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And I, you know, I'm grateful for, uh, for Tom Neal connecting us. So I interviewed him last <laughs> December, and uh, I think that came out in January of 2021 of this year. So, you know, he connected to us. So it's, it's just a blessing how uh, we find these um, uh, inspirational pockets of Catholicism in this field of dementia. So, Oh, absolutely. For sure. Jennifer, can you tell us what a healthcare chaplain does in a long-term care facility? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's kind of um, an interesting word. I just do want to point out to your listeners that um, uh, and a lot of people are surprised by this, especially within Catholic circles. Chaplains within the church are, of course, priests who work in a in a community-based setting. Uh, we use the word chaplain um, uh, sort of within the bounds of healthcare or different different um, functions. But anyways, in any case, I um, obviously am not a priest, obviously I'm not able to confer the sacraments. However, I am able to prefer, I am able to um, do the other aspects, which is um, a big part of, of the chaplaincy or spiritual care role is being able to provide support to people when they are um, in a time of need. So really providing spiritual and emotional support to people. Uh, we know, with, you know, being in a long-term care center, being in hospital, you're not there because you're on a picnic, you're there because um, something has changed in your life. So just helping people to process the change they're going through, helping them to sort of reorient themselves as they're trying to come to terms with this new, this new part of their life, um, this, these new aspects of their identity, helping them to sort of re, you know, when we've gone through a big trauma, whether it's sudden or sort of drawn out, we can kind of lose our way. And so helping people to um, reorient them to what matters to them. So what are their values? You know, what is their understanding of, of, you know, the God who loves them, helping them to reconnect that. When we talk about being a caregiver to people with dementia, it's, um, it's, I love it. It's like my, I love it. <laughs> it's my favorite part of my work. As so much of spiritual care or chaplaincy care to people with dementia is really about fostering connection and enabling expressions of love. Because um, as we'll talk about, I'm sure we'll talk about at length in our conversation today, um, as, as uh, maybe the cognitive intellect of a person declines, um, we, we know, uh, your viewers know from experience, we know from, from research, we know from our experience that although the cognitive aspects decline, the ability to recognize and distinguish and make sense of certain things in the world, the, well, all, while those decline, um, the capacity to love and the importance of connection and the intensity of feelings does not decline and if anything increases. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, my work is slightly different when I'm working with someone 
with advanced dementia than when I'm with somebody who uh, does not have dementia. Um, but in any case, it's really trying to, to identify what that person needs for their spirit and how I can facilitate that. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my most general answer <laughs> to the question. So it looks, you know, very different depending on who I'm with and, uh, and um, where they're at. And um, so we'll be talking about an article. We actually, we, we started talking about having an interview after you sent me an article that you had written that's a reflection upon with, with dementia upon the um, uh, St. John's Gospel. That's sort of how we started talking. And in that, um, you talked about having, uh, getting into an accident and having for a temporary, for a temporary uh, time, you had a cognitive impairment. Can you tell, um, tell us about what, how that gives you uh, gives you a different perspective now yeah i mean i think it really does so um about four years ago or three and a half years ago i was just in a minor like rear-ended accident and it shouldn't have been a big deal except the airbag in the back of my seat went off and like punched me in the back of the head and um, anyways, I just had a much worse concussion <laughs> than one would have expected from, mm -hmm. from a rear ender. Um, and I, as I say in my paper, and as I want, as it's clear to all of you, um, you know, a temporary concussion is not the same as dementia. I realize that it's not, but I truly think it's a grace that I was afforded some insight. So I remember I, could, uh, I had the I, I remember in the days after my accident um lying in bed and trying to pray trying to just pr like you know pray prayers I knew pray the rosary and I couldn't remember I couldn't stay concentrated or attentive enough to get past you know the first couple words of the our father Oh, wow. like I, I would just lose track of what I was doing. Not that I forgot the words, but I would just lose track of what I was doing. And it was so frustrating for me. And I remember having this moment of um, just this sheer like panic of, you know, I can't even do this. I can't even say a prayer I've known all my life. And um, I was just like hit with this incredible sense in that moment of this incredible unearned love of God almost like God was saying to me now you get it you don't have to earn my love you don't have to be smart enough or know the right words or be able to think your way to me I'm here and I love you that was just the sense not like a not that I heard an audible voice or anything but just this this sense in my spirit that this was this was um true and it was something that I like truly hadn't experienced prior to that. I mean, I certainly feel God loves me, but this, this, this unconditional love was just like, wow. And I really connected with that experience being like, it was only when I was brought low to the point that I couldn't do anything on my part <laughs> that I was able to sort of cut out all those parts of me that get in the way of hearing how much he loves me. Mm -hmm. And then, and then um, that same, that same kind of blur of time, um, I happened to be friends with um, the, the, the priest who's the, who's the chaplain at the main hospital in our town. And I asked him, I, I was talking to him about my accident and about how I wanted to come to, to church. And I knew that the lights and the sound and everything was going to be too overwhelming. And I knew that he said mass at the hospital. So I said, can I come to the hospital? And I said, I think I said to him, in case I have to lie down in the pews, no one's going to think I'm weird. <laughs> that's what that's because I didn't know if I'd be able to sit through, sit through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at that point he said to me, how about you stay home and I'll bring you communion. And so I was very grateful that he did that. And when he brought me communion that day, again, like, just I want to be careful again because I don't want to say that you know I mean just experiencing graces and things is not the only measure of God's activity in your life right obviously most of the time God is acting and moving in our life and we don't sense anything and in fact that's a sign of 
maturity often that we're not sensing anything. But at that time, just the sense of Jesus' presence in the sacrament, again, was like stronger than I've ever experienced. And I think, again, I think it's because of just my helplessness and my inability to try to think my way, you know, think my way to, mm -hmm. to all this. And even when I say that, you know, I don't, I'm not saying we should negate our mind and try to avoid thinking and trying to like, and we have an intellect from God and that's an incredible gift we have. I'm not saying anyone should actively, you know, try to just avoid thinking about God, but just right. once you can't think, I think our fear is if you can't think about God, how can I have a relationship with God? And the point of all of this is my experience was a more profound spiritual awareness than I would normally have, almost when all the other aspects of how I think were kind of quieted down for once. Um, like that part of my being was able to, able to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, you know how we talk about, you know, if somebody who's never encountered Christ, never, you know, become a believer, never, you know, have that faith awakening, whether they're baptized as a baby or whether they were, you know, we became a Christian as an adult. If someone hasn't encountered Christ, they don't really get what you're talking about, <laughs> you know, until they do. And I, I kind of think it's sort of like that. If you don't know, and again, maybe I, and again, maybe I'm totally wrong because I haven't, it was just a momentary little blip, but I felt like I had an insight there that I don't think I could have ever imagined otherwise. And perhaps my experience, and my experience when I'm with my patients or my residents who have dementia, like, I don't know, you just walk in the room sometimes and you just, you just, you just get this, like you, you, you feel like you feel the spirit there you feel that you like you know like you you're on hollow ground I, I just don't know how to <laughs> maybe I sound kooky saying this but I just mm -mm. I'm just telling you what I experience right so um and uh I, I it just gives me hope so my, my experience my temporary concussion and my you know my temporary this impairment I had and this concussion that I had um and uh of course I had a lot of other a lot of coping I had to do with sort of the, with some of the humiliating aspects of having this impairment temporarily. It was, it was humiliating at some parts. I mean, um, a lot of the things that were happening with me are things that happen with people with dementia, you know, like having extreme mood swings and mm -hmm. um, irritability, things that are, I normally have control over and I didn't. And it took me a long time to sort of forgive myself even for that because I was so ashamed of how erratic I was acting mm -hmm. um I didn't even realize it until like later on that I was able to look back like why was I why did this crush me so much and you know but that's something too, so that was also part of the experience of my concussion that I find um I guess helps me to feel empathy yeah or to, to empathize with with um you know, what the people I meet every day are, are dealing with. Yeah. That makes sense because I mean, just to be, just to, to, to work in a long-term care facility, uh, you have to have empathy and it, it, it sounds like this grace gave you another level, you know, that, that I, you know, I may never know um, you got closer and then it's, and then you're here to be able to be a witness to that and sort of speak for not sort of, but you're speaking for, you know, many, uh, the loved ones of the caregivers who are listening right now and that they still feel, um, they can still feel humil hum humiliation. At least I, uh, intellectually, that's what I believe that they still, they know something's oh. going on. They, they may or may not know, Hey, I have dementia or recognize yeah. that, but I think they know something's going on. It can be humiliating mm -hmm. losing those faculties. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I was, I was, saying something there was another there's a nurse we i mean we're during covid we're all wearing masks all the time so we kind of look similar mm -hmm. and there was a nurse who i've often been mistaken for and she came in to where i was and the man we were talking to a gentleman with dementia he was like oh oh like 
like he was doing a double take because we look so much alike. And I said to him, I said, oh yeah, someone else thought I was this nurse. And when he realized it wasn't, he hung his head. He was disappointed, right? And then the man said to me, this man with dementia goes, no, he was embarrassed. And I was just like, oh, like I, it never even dawned on me that perhaps the reason this man hung his head was because he was embarrassed that he made a mistake. But this other gentleman with dementia picked up on that right away. And I was like, wow, that was really like an eye-opening experience for me, you know? Um, I think the research shows that, you know, the, the perception of emotions and the, the depth of emotions, um, so many of those things like humiliation and, and shame and fear, once we have advanced dementia or even moderate dementia, we may not be able to name them, but we certainly feel them. And so much of my work is tapping into kind of like picking up on what people are actually feeling right now and what can I do to help them feel like safe with that, right? Um, and people don't say, usually I feel, you know, I feel abandoned. My family hate, you know, my family has abandoned me. I'm undeserving of love, but they'll say other things that tells you that that's what they are experiencing, right? Um, and, uh, do you have an example of something, oh, something that well, they might say to, um, to express that, that feeling? Um, yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. So, I mean, again, and this is, you know, all of this is happening right now in a time where for, for good reasons, um, we have really strict, um, restrictions on visiting long-term care centers because of dementia, uh, because of, sorry, because of COVID-19. Right. Unfortunately, um, for the people that we are we are supporting, um, their understanding of that is maybe incomplete and varies from day to day. Mm -hmm. And even if we can tell them, even if they can repeat it back to us, how much they, that actually carries with them. So there's a lot of sense that my family must hate me. I must have done something very wrong. That's why they're not coming anymore. Or they hate me. Um, um, if I worked harder, it's because I'm not working anymore. It's because I'm, um, it's because, because I, like they'll, they'll refer to some event. They'll, it's because, of, it's because I let the little boy run across the street. You know, things like, something happened where they made a mistake in their past and they're feeling like they're being punished for it now, for example. It takes, I mean, it's not usually, it takes usually a lot of getting to know people and sort of knowing their personality, knowing what was important to them, knowing what their mm -hmm. roles were in their life to realize, you know, or it, it's mostly concerns about, does my family hate me mm. because they're not here? Yeah. And yeah. I know sometimes even without COVID, um, a caregiver, you know, you could be going maybe every day to see your loved one and 10 minutes after you leave until you come again, you know, the person is living right in the moment and feeling abandoned. And so I understand that it's very pain mm -hmm. painful. I can't really think of something that's probably more painful for, you yeah. know, for, especially for caregivers, you know, I've <sighs> sons and daughters and spouses in tears all the time when they're having to leave, we, we do have some visitation, although it's limited, or when they have to leave and they're seeing, you know, the person they have to leave behind, crying and asking them not to go. And mm -hmm. that, that really, it's really hard. It's really hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that really answered your question about how I, how someone might say it. Um, you know, people's, people's body language, mm -hmm. um, doesn't really change when you have dementia. Right. Right. Yeah. That's and oftentimes, point. oftentimes I find people with dementia are still really good at reading body language. You know, it's a lot of like sort of the non verbal, non verbal communication that mm -hmm. kind of gets uh, amped up. Um, so let me, let me ask you something. So, so the, the article, um, just so everybody knows, the article is not about 
Jennifer's journey after having this temporary cognitive impairment, although that informs it, I think that's why it's really important is that it informs the really insightful things that she expresses in there. And something else, I'm going to, so we don't want to reveal the whole article to everybody because we want everybody to read it. And there's also so much in there. We'd probably be talking for two hours. <laughs> so I'll pull out some themes and then I encourage you to, you know, to also inject some things that you want to make sure some highlights that, that our audience will see. Uh, and one of those things I wanted to start with is the, the idea that um, our loved ones with dementia, they still um, want to show love. They still, they still look for love. And it's sort of, this is a good segue from what we were just talking about. So how do, how do they show this, still this consideration for other people and the importance of relationships? Yeah. And um, so, and I, I just want to say too, before I go, before I answer that question, I was really excited. I came across an article about one of my favorite saints, St. Edith Stein and um, mm -hmm. a Steinian approach to dementia. And a lot of the things that were written about kind of lend support some of the observations I've made. So I feel a bit more confident. <laughs> Although I tried to read my paper in scripture primarily, and then I did talk about my anecdote. Um, but it just adds confidence that sort of this philosophical or phenomenal, this, this philosophical approach kind of also mm -hmm. lends support, but so love. Um, so, so first of all, like some of the simple acts of love. I mean, I think very much of like a St. Therese of Lisieux style of showing love in small acts, right? Um, oh, like the gentleman who will, you know, I'm trying to get them to the dining room table and they're like pulling out the chair for me as the gentleman oh, wow. would yeah. to offer me to yeah. sit down first. <laughs> And sometimes the only way we can get around it is, okay, I'll sit down. No, you sit beside me because um, they're just so gentlemanly, right? Or um, someone who will, you know, having a cup of tea and they're offering me their, they're offering me their dinner. Um, sometimes I can't sit with someone at a, at a meal because I'm not allowed to eat because of the whole COVID precautions with masks. I'm not allowed to take my mask off. And so they're like, oh, I, I can't eat in front of you. <laughs> so, oh, you know, right. I mean, it's sure it's a manners thing, but it's also a love. It's a love, an act of love to, to mm -hmm. want to make sure that the person in your host, in your company is, is being looked after. Right. Mm -hmm. um, oh my goodness. There's this one lady who just, I just, I mean, I love all these guys so much, you know, these people that I've like journeyed with for like a long time. They're just, I, I love them. And this one lady, sometimes all she wants is just to, She'll just like hold my hand, just like stroke my hand as though she's soothing, as though she's soothing her child or, or, mm -hmm. or, you know, and, she, um, and, or some, what, some people will come and they'll like stroke my face, you know, and um, just these little acts of tenderness that they would, like the way that a parent would, would soothe or, like, you know, touch their, their, their child, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, I know I gave some other examples. Um, some some of the people there, um, what what oftentimes with, sometimes people with uh, dementia find soothing is to have like a lifelike animal, right? Like a lifelike pet, mm -hmm. and some of these you know these little animals animatronics now that will kind of purr and that kind of stuff, and just how how loving and doting these you know these people are to these little animals, and at moments they're like oh this is my toy, but it still just evokes all this like caring you know all these six signs of caring the caringness comes out of people um one of the gentlemen there he will he will um he he unfortunately was struggling with some paranoid tendencies but his instinct was trying to to protect me right he was like checking around corners to make sure it was safe for me to go around and um you know it i still see love in that you know like he's oh, yeah. he was looking out for me he was, he was looking out for me. He wasn't, certainly he was looking out for himself and others, but he was looking at, you know what I mean? He was, he was, he was looking out for me and that wasn't that. Yeah. There was know? a purpose. There was a purpose yeah. to it. Not, not a psychosis, but more of a, you know, he had that hallucination yeah. or that paranoia, yeah. but it was out yeah. of love that he was doing that. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's so clear to me. And especially with your examples that there needs to be an outlet for our loved ones. Like we have to facilitate that whether they want to stroke our hand or yeah. if they want to hold a grandchild or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or just the, the hand holding makes me think back 
and I know we could probably do a whole other podcast on this, but um, uh, what I'm aware of is that sometimes in a long-term care facility, there might be a resident who is uh, aggressive sexually um, mm. when it's really just misplaced, trying, they're trying to give affection. They don't know it's not appropriate, but, you know, but they also don't, the, the administration may not think like, well, they probably just, you know, holding their hand, having somebody from a family member, a volunteer, a friend just to hold their hand might um, sort of assuage that, um, that need to give uh, appropriate intimacy. Yeah, I think friend. that's certainly worth exploring in, in situations like that, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I mean, it's not as simple as that, I don't think, but I think it's sure. certainly appropriate to consider, right? Um, right? And I don't think you suggesting that it is, but you're right. I mean, oftentimes, you know, there's, there are, that, that's an interesting point too. And this, so um, a similar thing that I've discovered um, uh, not, not in terms of like violent sexual behavior or even like physically sexual behavior, but expressions of, um, expressions of like desire for intimacy with, with a caregiver, you know, with, with like a, a nurse or, or a chaplain or someone else who's actually stopping and spending time and listening. Mm -hmm. And I do like I do like I totally see how that can is like for the person this like this sense of somebody loves me somebody cares about me and so you're right like it's inappropriate for them to say you know like I want to be sexually intimate with you or whatever but it is for the person to hear it to being like to realize okay I know that you care a lot like you're feeling a sense of connection to me you're feeling love for me so how do I re-channel that and redirect mm -hmm. that into you know a gentle reminder that I'm not I'm not your lover <laughs> I am a chaplain mm -hmm. you know um um and it can be hard because oftentimes people you know people are married and and I and I'm thinking if I if this was my husband talking like this to a nurse or or a care worker of some kind I'm sure it would be devastating to me, but I'm trying to help, I'm trying to, re I'm starting to see, it's not really about him no longer loving me, but loving the nurse. It's about, it's about, like you're saying that, that connection, right? That, that like, mm -hmm. I need to know that somebody loves me. And so I try to not be freaked out by that, <laughs> not be right. like threatened by that, but try to like, gently kind of like get them back into oh tell me about your wife tell me about your children tell me about your loved ones right mm -hmm. but still letting the per realizing it's kind of like has to do with like you know with with like the idea of like transference and counter transference with all that in like therapeutic situations right um that for those who don't understand don't, don't have familiarity with that terms of transference so it's like a like psychoanalysis from freud like the idea that when you are and i don't really know a lot about <laughs> I don't know much about Freud psychoanalysis, so bear with me, but, but basically that when you are interacting with your therapist, you start kind of projecting on them your anger towards your parents or your love towards your parents or whoever mm -hmm. else. And that's a concept that has carried through to other modalities of therapy that, you know, the therapeutic relationship between um, um, like the therapist or like chaplain kind of similar to a therapist in that in that regard um and the person who's receiving care um they're going to um, sort of you know start projecting their feelings about various other relationships onto their relationship with the therapist and that's kind of a sort of a foundational concept in in therapy right that mm -hmm. and then it's up to the therapist to recognize that and to you know gently address that and and uh you know, use that as a, usually it's helping to help sort of reveal what's going on deeper in the person. And that certainly happens in terms of caring for people with dementia. And it's certainly complicated and painful because um, again, like we know that people's recognition of others is often a problem. Like we, you know, we know this, like, you know, you don't, you think I'm, you think I'm your mother, you think I'm your, you know, I'm your wife, and now you think I'm your mother, or you think I'm, mm -hmm. I'm your daughter, and it's, it's, um, you know, I think 
for us who do not have dementia, um, uh, we, so much of our, like relationship is super important, right? And then as Christians, we believe our relationships are super important, especially our relationship with God, but also our relationship with one another, our neighbor, right? Mm -hmm. And so to have a relationship forgotten or to have an aspect of it to be not recognized by a loved one is very painful to us. And I try to point out to people that, you, you know, your loved one might not recognize you as, as the spouse anymore, but your loved one recognizes you. Like you are someone who walks in the door and your loved one lights up. Right. They might not remember <laughs> that it's about marriage, they might not remember that you're their daughter or their son or their, you know, but they know that you and me, we are connected. Mm -hmm. You are mine. And so, and I've had some like awesome caregivers who tell me this, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I kind of feel like I lost the husband relationship with my husband, but he's still my, like, like the wife was saying to me, I've lost the husband part of him, <laughs> we'll call him Bob, a Bob, but he's still my Bob and I'm still his is Jane, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and her coming to terms with, with that was like how she's coping with, how does she keep having a relationship, a caring relationship um, with her husband, with her Bob, even when mm -hmm. he doesn't realize that, that, that she's his wife, right? Yeah. So, so um, actually I, I read a great term and I love it. I know you use the term, care partners, which I love. Um, but another term that I saw, and this was again in the paper about, or the chapter about Edith Stein, was talking about primary sufferers of dementia and secondary sufferers. Oh, yeah, so a caregiver. Have you heard that one before? No, no, I haven't. Yeah. So, so, you know, we talk about like um, primary research and secondary research. So primary is like a primary witness was on the scene. A secondary witness was someone who tells about like when you watch the evening news mm -hmm. and you're hearing the news, that's a secondary witness, as opposed to if you were actually there on the street yourself and saw, saw what happened. So a primary sufferer, the person who's actually experiencing the dementia in their head, and then a secondary sufferer, you know, it acknowledges that it acknowledges the relationship between the two parties and also that the suffering is real. I mean, so caregivers, I mean, you are, your suffering is real. And one thing is you're often, um, I mean, like, of course, so much goes into caring for your loved one who has dementia. And that can be hard. Um, that can be really hard. And your own suffering and needs are often sort of by necessity pushed to the side. Um, but your needs matter too. And your suffering is real too. Mm -hmm. And um, And you... You might need to have that acknowledged, you know, and um, and your loved one with dementia might have to acknowledge that too, especially in the early stages, right? Because the person having dementia um, might not like might be angry with you and not realize that you're doing everything you can to help them, right? That's going to be a common experience. What like oh, you're just putting me in this home because you don't care about me anymore, or not? They don't realize. That you're that you can't do everything, right? Or you're calling for a help, you're calling for an aide to come in. Like, why can't you do it? You know, and and so that's the suffering too, right? Of of as your loved ones losing their perspective, mm -hmm. you know, and their sort of insight and self awareness to a degree. Yeah, I just I just just sort of kind of felt like adding that, Matt. <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's really that's great from that, and that that was the um. It was an essay or article from from Edith Stein. Yeah, so it's um it's a book on Edith Stein by um a a professor in Northern Ireland, but I believe she's from Germany herself. Um, I can't speak German, so forgive me. I think her name's Meta Le Lebeck, L E B E C H is her last name. Um, and she has written a book on Edith Stein and Lo and behold, the last chapter is about um, a Steinian approach to understanding dementia, and it's fantastic. So maybe I can send you the name of that book, and you can put it in the show notes sure. too, if, yeah, if people want to 
look at it. Yeah. Can you tell um, everybody? Can you tell everybody about Edith Edith Stein? Because I had to look up Saint Edith Stein. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> so you're teaching me a lot. Well, okay. So, um, Saint Edith Stein, aka Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Um, she, oh, okay. I'm just sighing because it's like, how do I do this incredible person justice? Right, um, right. So she uh, actually, she was one of the most brilliant philosophers in the 20th century. She was, um, uh, she was born in a pious Jewish, Jewish family. She was, I think, the youngest of several children. Her father died when she was very young. Her mother managed to like raise these kids and have a successful business and all this. As a teenager, this brilliant young girl sort of became an atheist, um, went on to study, um, just like a super sharp mind, right? And um, as a ethnically Jewish person and as a woman, she just experienced like glass ceiling after glass ceiling. She was kind of seen as like the secretary to these great philosophers, but she was actually editing their work for them and she wasn't getting the credit. Anyways, um, and I really just can't do her justice. But anyways, she uh, had some friends. Actually, her, her conversion started with, she went, she was with a, a girlfriend and they went into, they wanted to go in and see a beautiful cathedral. They wanted to go in together. And they, to, just, you know, to marvel the, the artwork of these beautiful European cathedrals, like, you know, the, the, the structures, all that. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> just yeah. the beauty of the cathedral. And when she went in, she was so struck by a woman she saw there praying who had just obviously just ducked into the church. You know, her shopping bags, her groceries were with her. She had just obviously on her way home and made an effort to come and stop. And she saw this woman just in the midst of her ordinary life who had come to pray. And she just could tell, like, this woman clearly has a relationship with this God that she thinks she's talking to, right? So that kind of awoken something in her. And then later, if I understand correctly, um, she was staying with some friends who were, who were Catholic or Christian at least. And um, they had a book, um, um, St. Teresa of Avila's biography. Um, and she was looking for something to read. So she read it all night she, in the morning. She said, this is truth. And she became like a week later, she walked up to a priest and she's like, I want to be baptized. And he said, well, you have to be, you know, you have to have catechism first. And she said, test me. So he started asking her questions. She knew it and he <laughs> baptized her because she, she just had like studied so intently anyways. Um, so, uh, so she becomes years, a nun, right? So she, becomes she becomes a Carmelite, a Carmelite nun. nun. Yeah, she becomes a Carmelite nun in Germany. And of course, so this is during the 1930s. Um, and of course, this is as Nazism is starting to rise and um, the climate for people who are who are Jewish, either practicing their faith or ethnically are Jewish is very, very negative. So mm -hmm. the Carmelites transfer her to uh, the Netherlands, to a Dutch convent. And um, while she was there, well, anyways, maybe they started in Germany, but because she was such a brilliant philosopher, you know, but her her mother superior ordered her to continue writing her philosophy, like not to give it up, but mm -hmm. to keep writing. So she did. Um, anyways, so this is actually a really what happened, um, and I think it's really quite an interesting moral lesson in this. Um, in August of uh, whatever year it was, I'm sorry, 1943 maybe, um, there was. The, all of the churches in the Netherlands came together. They were now under Nazi occupation. They came together and they wrote a letter of protest against the deportation of Jews from the Netherlands. But they had to submit it to their to the Nazi government before they could read it. The Nazi government said, "You have no business talking about this. If you want, you can change the letter to say that you protest." the deportation of Jewish converts to Christianity. We'll let you read that letter. So um, the Catholic church said, nope, we're not changing the letter. And, and all of the other denominations did change the letter. So that Sunday, um, you know, under the guidance of the Catholic bishop, they read the letter that no, you know, deportation of the Jews is wrong, period. 
it doesn't matter if they've joined our team or not. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's not the issue. Right. It's wrong to deport these people. Whereas the other churches had, you know, vacillated. So there was a huge backlash and any priest or nun or religious, and actually I think other converts to other Catholic Jewish converts, like Jew, Jewish people who had converted to Catholicism, they were rounded up, shipped off to Auschwitz and, and killed. Right. And Edith and her sister were among them. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And then she was canonized by St. John Paul II. Is that correct? Yeah. And he, yeah. And St. John Paul II was um, like, he was, he, his, he was a great philosopher too, right? His philosophy was inspired by her. Like he, he looked to her and her, her thinking and teaching um, to inspire his a great like, sort of philosophy of Christian personalism. Again, I'm not a philosopher, so I might be getting this wrong, but I know that he credits her as one of the great thinkers. So um, yeah, so he, 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 he beatified and then canonized her. So, and, and I should note that today is October 22nd, the day we're recording. It's the feast day of St. John Paul II. Absolutely. So special graces for that. And we're going to do the luminous mysteries in a little while. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, St. John Paul II, like I, <laughs> um, I'll let the, the viewers know that I said to Matt, I was so excited that we're recording on this day. Um, just because, you know, on this topic of dementia, oh my goodness, he's, he is such a great intercessor, I think, because, you know, his own journey with Parkinson's, his own journey with showing the, um, showing the the dignity of the human person you know there were I remember at the time the calls there were to you know for him to step down to resign to you know he was too considered too un, unwell to continue in the papacy and he did not and that was an incredible tremendous witness right of his human dignity mm -hmm. and of the human dignity of all of us and he believed so much in uh, the mystery of redemptive suffering he believed he he begged for the prayers of those who were suffering uh, when various friends of his suffered greatly he very humbly but very solemnly believed that their that they obtained graces for him and for his papacy you know suffering you know i would really encourage reader uh, viewers you know um if you're looking for a theological treatise on suffering, you know, Pope John Paul II is the place to start. And um, there's actually, you know, <laughs> if, if, if reading Vatican encyclical seems a little too, too daunting to get started, there's a great book by Jason Evert called uh, St. John Paul the Great, his, actually I have it right here, let me get the title, his, his Five Loves, St. John Paul the Great, His Five Loves, and there's a chapter in suffering on there um, and how it featured in his life. And I mean, Frankly, Pope John Paul II is like walking, like walking the talk, right? I mean, he lost his mother at a very young age, lost his father as a young man, and his brother um, shot, <laughs> you know, you know, attempted assassination, broke his femur, had Parkinson's, and as a young man going through seminary, working, you know, working in a quarry all day for um, you know, under the communist government that he was he was living under, and then like secretly studying in seminary at night. I mean, this he's he knows what he's talking about, right? So, um, yeah, I just, um, sometimes when we talk about suffering, it can sound kind of irritating and maddening if somebody, especially, like, I don't know, perhaps some of you guys watching this are like, you don't know what dementia is like, you had a concussion, it's not dementia. And yeah, <laughs> I totally own that. Fair, like, fair you enough, know, I, right. I don't want to, I don't want to make that suffering more than it is. At the same time, like Pope John Paul II, like, you know, he's talking from the depths. Like he, he's yes. been there and done that. And that Major is a comfort credibility. for sure. Yeah, that's a comfort for sure. Yeah. And just like, like you guys, you know, you, you viewers who um, the suffering that you are going through and the graces and the experiences, you know, you know, that's some that's something that you have that that um 
makes you, <laughs> makes you a valid, you know, like, like makes you not valid, even what's the word, but what's the word you just said, like credibility, right? Credibility, like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many things that we don't understand in life until we walk through them and live. Through Absolutely. Them. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah. sometimes I feel strange talking about redemptive suffering and we've had many guests come on. Um, Tom talked about it, Tom Neal, Dr. Tom Neal, Dr. Roland Miller. We've talked about it on many, um, many of these podcast episodes have written about it. And um, I feel strange coming from where I am because, you know, my suffering is not like that of a dementia caregiver, but I like to say yet, because I, who knows what, you know, what my future holds as being a caregiver or not being a caregiver. Um, but I feel or, good. Or, or a person who's going to live with dementia. Exactly. Right? Yes. 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 We just, yeah, we don't know. Um, it's that, I hear from people in our community, those who receive the newsletter, uh, they write me back and they, you know, they affirm, you know, the things that, that I'm saying, and it's not for my ego. It's uh, because I do need to be, they do need to keep me on track and let me know, encourage and say, yes, we want to hear more about this. Yes, this is how I'm feeling. And so it's, re it's refreshing when we have someone who is a model, a witness like John Paul II um, to talk about redemptive suffering. And, you know, I, it, you know, and we're going to, we're going to keep doing it in, um, you know, on this channel, uh, in this ministry, because it is such a key thing. It's something I grew up without, you know, in my Catholic life. Um, you know, I consider myself a revert, revert as well, because um, well, I think it was more of a cultural Catholic, which one of my priest friends, uh, you know, uh, talked about one time in a sermon, like you grow up Catholic and you, you think you do Catholic things, but you're not, you, you, you don't, you don't get it yet. But, um, but, but now I do. So anyway, I didn't grow up in a, in a household that talked about redemptive suffering and offering up yeah. these for the souls in purgatory or for, or, or for others, but I do that now for sure. Um, but it's something it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's be emerged as a very important theme in the last 12 months. Um, and something that, and, and there's, there's no, um, there's not a shortage of encyclicals and theology about redemptive suffering. So we have we have a lot to talk about, a lot of a lot of material to cover. And I'm just realizing as we're talking about this too, how much of this is also um, in part like this discomfort we're saying like, oh, well, because I also didn't, I have a similar upbringing to you. Like it didn't really, didn't really like, it wasn't really a lived, a lived experience of, of, of this um, growing up. And um, I think it can be, I'm just realizing for myself, like I, it, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, our sufferings, coming to realize that our suffering, maybe it's the wrong question, like comparing, comparing big sufferings to little sufferings, right? right. Um, like our little suffering. And sometimes by, by making it into a big deal about suffering, it almost isolates, it can also almost isolate the person who who's going through it because it can be a temptation to say well I don't want to be insensitive I have no idea how bad it is so I'm just going to stay away and that's often a complaint that caregivers have right that right. everyone kind of I don't know what to say and they kind of forget and I'm not saying you're doing this but I'm saying I see myself doing this um or this temptation to uh almost make a golf <laughs> you know but really even you know but we have you know we um I think any of us who have had, who have taken on faith that uniting your suffering with Christ makes a difference, even if it's a little thing like, you know, like, like an upset stomach or, or like a really painful, like paper cut, you know? Yeah, something um, passing. Yeah, something yeah. passing, but still, even just practicing on those little things, you do realize that like there's something to it. Like God really is there, right? And God really is, is present. And um, so not to, maybe thinking about like, it, it's just probably not good for any of us to start like trying to rank our sufferings as who suffered more. Cause that's not really, that's not really the right. I, I, I don't see for me how that ever ends up helpful, <laughs> you know, but still <laughs> having us to have the humility to realize that that yeah other people um have been through more than i have right and and um and uh so far 
and maybe that's, you know, they're getting ready. So they're able to turn around and be a support to, to um, people who are experience future great suffering mm -hmm. to be able to support them. Um, yeah, but yeah, I guess my, my um, yeah, so maybe this, that little segue of our conversation about, you know, my, my quickness to say, I'm not comparing you my head injury to dementia is maybe a reflection of sort of my, my discomfort, right? And my, my tendency to want to compare and rank things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's me having to tell myself, you know, this is not a competition, yeah. right? We're, we're all in this, in the body together. And for those who are experiencing suffering, it's an, you know, there's just so much like there's suffering. Pope Benedict says, like, there's no love without suffering, right? There's no love without sacrifice. There's no, um, whether you're the person who's suffering and passively what you have to offer the world is the opportunity to let yourself be loved. Whether you're the person who's called to, you know, heroic lengths to care for someone who's suffering, um, whether you're the person who can, who can meet someone with empathy because of what you've walked through, or whether you're the person who's suffering alone and like Saint Therese, like you know how she was like, considered a great missionary, even though she never left her convent, but her prayers, you know, were very powerful and you know converted many souls of, you know, I think, you know, even if your suffering is not observed by anyone else but God and yourself, um, you know, if we if we trust what you know Pope John Paul and these other great saints have to say about suffering, then you know and redemptive suffering in particular, just that, you know, those sufferings, especially those hidden sufferings offered up, known to no one but God, can be incredibly powerful in the economy of the economy of grace, right? Mm -hmm. So um Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, I was just, I was just making, I was making a quick note to, um, to come, to come back to this, you know, in particular, um, later on, because I want to get some highlights too, and I, I appreciate everything that we're, you know, talking about, you know, the redemptive suffering. Um, any, um, any final comments that you want to make before we transition to our, the luminous mysteries of the Holy Rosary? Um. Uh, uh, oh gosh, I mean. We are, oh yeah, I do have a comment. Again, we've mentioned Dr. Tom Neal a number of times and he wrote, recently featured a quote on his, um, on his blog about suffering. And um, he quoted a, a former slave named William Grimes who had been wrongfully accused of stealing something and being beaten by his, by, by his owner. Um, and what anguish it caused in him that he was being mistreated. And then he said, he had this, this incredible moment, like this self-awareness, I wrote it down. It, he said, it, it says, I said to myself, if this thing is done in a green tree, what must be done in a dry? So if this, if this anguish, if this suffering, if this despair can happen in a tree that's alive, like alive with Christ, what must happen in a, in a dry tree. So in someone, what must happen in the soul of someone who doesn't know Christ? Yeah. And, you know, I think if I could just offer something to everyone, just um, you, you know, the love of God. Amazing. Like praise God. Thank God. Like I say, when I do my, I do a little like um Bible reading prayer service thing a couple times a week with my residents, like it's non-denominational prayer service. And every time I'm like, thank you God for loving us and letting us know that you love him, you know? And uh, sometimes I think we're called, I mean, God doesn't will suffering. God doesn't will evil, but God, we know, what we know from divine providence, like what we know about divine providence is God will very happily use any suffering for our good if we consent to letting him use it and how you know oftentimes when we are suffering something um 
it brings us to places we would not have gone otherwise, right? It brings us into a hospital ward and all of a sudden you have a chance to love on your roommate or, you know, it brings you to um, a rehabilitation center um, and you get to meet other, other patients, right? And so um, what I'm trying to say is you, may, may, may all of you who are watching this, who are hearing this know that nothing like nothing, none of this, none of this is outside the, the confines of God's love for you, right? You, like may you, may this be, may this time, this journey, I mean, there's so many other things on your mind, but may this journey glorify God. May this journey help you to love your neighbor, help you to love the person maybe who doesn't, who's going through this without knowing Christ and asks you, how are you, like, you know, <laughs> maybe this seems not a biggest deal, but like that lady who went into the cathedral to pray and Edith Stein saw her and she ended up becoming this great saint. Don't hide your light under your bushel basket. You know, like what opportunities, like, you know, your faithful witness, your faithful witness as you love your, love your, your, your loved one. And during this suffering, like you, like we just have no idea how God is going to use it for your good, for the good of your loved one, for the good of strangers. You know, you, you won't know the side of heaven. So just, um, you know, may may the words that you say as your head hits the pillow every night is Jesus, I trust in you. Like may that become your your heartbeat. You know that He loves you, and He's not forgotten you in this. He's not forgotten you, and He not forgotten your loved one he is at work in you in your loved one just just know oh, just know god's never ending abiding love and presence and care for you that's how i'd like to end praise god that's a beautiful ending jennifer um thank you for being here we're going to transition to the uh to the holy rosary so um, if you're listening right now on the audio podcast, go to the next track, the next episode. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube or another platform, please stick around. We'll be back, and we're going to pray the luminous mysteries of the Holy Rosary. So thanks for being here, and we'll see you in a moment. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Peace with Dementia Rosary podcast. I hope that you listen to the conversation with me and Jennifer Fabrizi, and we are now going to pray the luminous mysteries of the Holy Rosary. And it's especially uh, apropos that we do this today, because today is October 22nd. As we're recording this, it's the Feast of St. John Paul II. He instituted the luminous mysteries in 2002, so that's why we chose this special set of mysteries to pray. So everyone get your rosaries out. Um, and if you are joining us on the audio podcast, I, I encourage you again to, um, to go back to the previous track after you pray with us, to go back and listen to the conversation that Jennifer and I had. It was, it was amazing. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I think that you will enjoy it and get a lot out of it as well. So we will go ahead and get started. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, where he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. These um, three Hail Marys are for faith, hope, and charity an increase in these. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Um, I'm going to make sure that we um, are able to include um, any special prayer intentions um, uh, between us um, that, we, that we have, but also for our audience. So if you're watching this, uh, where there's a, a, if you're watching this on a platform or listening to this on a platform where there are, there's an opportunity to, to type in a, a comment, we welcome you to, to type in any um, special prayer intentions. And of course, we encourage you to visit our dementia prayer wall at dementiarosary.com because uh, we always pray for um, those as well. So um, Jennifer, do you have any particular uh, prayer intentions that you wanted to mention either related to, to dementia or, or not? Yeah, especially I'd like to pray for all of um, all of the residents and their families, uh, residents at my long-term care facility and their families. Um, and uh, just in general for people, um, especially for people living in long-term care during this time of time of these extreme restrictions mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, lack of visitation. It's, it's really hard. So I'd like to pray for, for, for them. Amen. Well, they're definitely included in our prayers. We also um, pray for the repose of the soul of anybody um, in our dementia Rosier community um, who did not make us um, aware of that. And we pray for peace also for their family as they, uh, as they um, go to Jesus for, for comfort in this very challenging time as well. And uh, we're going to do the luminous mystery. So I'm going to read the prayer intentions from the, um, from the book. And uh, let's see. So, and this is the piece with dementia rosary. Many of you who are in our audience, you're aware that uh, this book is available at our website. I don't do enough of uh, telling people about it, but I encourage you to purchase it from the website if possible, as opposed to Amazon uh, et cetera, because, um, well, we'll have more contributions come to the ministry instead of going to Jeff Bezos and all of Amazon. So, but however you can get it is, uh, is, uh, is what's really important. So we, uh, the first luminous mystery is the baptism of the Lord. The, um, the prayer intention for this particular um, uh, mystery is Our Lady of Grace, we thank you for this opportunity to serve the Lord and our loved one. Please help us to seek and to find the blessings and gifts that you send through our loved ones. In times of great stress, let us remember these blessings to get us through the difficult days and moments. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. And lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. The second luminous mystery, the wedding at Cana. The intention from the book, page 29. Queen of all saints, we pray for families to keep traditions alive and find creative ways to adjust to keep their loved ones involved. Please give our loved one, please, please give our loved one the peace to enjoy the event and the people who are present. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. And lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Amen. The third luminous mystery, <clears throat> the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven. Queen of families, in this very stressful time, please bless our families that they may work and sacrifice together for the betterment of their loved one with dementia. Please allow family members to forgive each other after a conflict and to proactively serve each other. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Amen. Amen. The fourth luminous mystery, the transfiguration of the Lord. Our Lady of Confidence, we pray that we have the courage to be an informed, persistent, and respectful advocate, able to balance our emotions and knowledge with that of the professional that we're working with. Help us to gain willing cooperation, to see, see things from the professional's point of view, show appreciation, and build trust with the care team, even in times of stress. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Amen. 
the fifth luminous mystery, the institution of the Eucharist. The intention from the book. Most Holy Mary, please give care partners the wisdom to know when, the care, when, a, when a care community is the correct next step and guide them to find the right place. Bless the transition for the person living with dementia that they may, may experience peace in that care, care community. Help the care partners overcome any feelings of guilt and to channel that energy into visiting often and being the proper advocate. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who to need of thy mercy. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. O God, whose only begotten Son, by his life, death, and resurrection, has purchased for us the rewards of eternal salvation. Grant, we beseech thee, that while meditating on these mysteries of the most holy rosary of the blessed Virgin Mary, that we may imitate what they contain and obtain what they promise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone ever fled to your protection, employed your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Sorry, everyone, I just dropped my screen there. <laughs> Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee. O Virgin of virgins, my mother, to thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. Amen. St. John the Evangelist, patron saint of care partners. Pray for us. St. Dimpna, patron saint of those with brain disorders. Pray for us. St. Raphael the Archangel, patron saint of healing. Pray for us. And St. John Paul II. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, that was wonderful.
that was thank yeah, you for yeah. praying with me. And uh, it's always a great way to um, you know, conclude a, a wonderful conversation, you know, trying to uh, help others and, uh, you know, inspire people in the Peace with Dementia Rosary community. So thank you, Jennifer, for being here. Um, any, anything, anything that we didn't get to talk about, anything you wanted to mention to our audience before we close up? Um, yeah, gosh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this conversation and to have a chance with an audience with your awesome, awesome people who, who are part journeying along with you. Um, no, just, um, uh, I just had want to say just yeah just thank you and god loves you don't forget that don't forget that um uh, god be with you all as you continue in this journey that's all i got amen <laughs> amen praise god well everybody um make sure that if you haven't seen our conversation yet it's um it's another audio track on the audio piece with dementia rosary podcast make sure you go back and listen to our conversation I think you'll be inspired and I think you're going to learn and um, I, I think it will help a company um, as we hope all of the um, everything from this ministry does. Uh, Jennifer, thanks again. Thank you for your vocation and thank you especially for being here today. Thank you so much, Matt. It was awesome. Thanks. <laughs>